I still got it unfolded from where we were using it a while ago. Right about here. Okay, right there. All right, we're clear. I'm going hot and I'm going to shoot one on the head. Once I started getting serious with the shop and went full time with it as far as building custom rifles, at first it was people that was shooting competition stuff, which is kind of a natural fit because that's the way I got introduced into most of it. Before we started building our own competition rifles, uh, the more we were competing in law enforcement uh, and military competitions, I started getting phone calls or being contacted regarding, hey, could you do this little job or that little job or do this for us? Um, that turned out well, and then, you know, the next step would be complete rifles. I don't have any rings or anything in the chamber, so everything's looking good on that. Once I get that chamber cut and I'm looking for boo-boos or adjustments, if I take that barrel out and then go, ah, oh, you know, it's got a burr there or this hair or whatever, or I should have done something, or maybe I needed to make some kind of cleanup pass on something, it's a lot harder at that point to put it back in here and re-zero it because all the surfaces I used to zero the barrel to begin with aren't there. I just cut a chamber in there, right? So we want to really, really inspect it before I pull it out. My clientele is absolutely trusting me, same way with our training stuff. They trust me to provide something for them that is going to be consistent and it's going to be reliable and um, it's going to work under any conditions and it allows me to pay 100% attention on any of the rifles that are going out here that are bound for an agency or bound for an individual officer that's purchasing it. Almost indefinitely with every customer we've ever done, we have some type of rapport with that's developed before that's actually developed or else they wouldn't trust me to do it. Can I be perfect on everything I'm doing? Absolutely not. Anytime there's a human involved that's touching things and doing things, something can happen, I can miss something with the intent and my seriousness that I take the job and everything from the way I design the parts, the way I machine the parts, the way I finish them, the way I test them, and, and before I send them out the door, is the intent is to minimize that possibility of anything happening. This gun is finished. Everything's already been checked out on it. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure that I've got a clean bore, uh, run one more patch to it, make sure there's no grit or any kind of debris that got in there where I was handling it through the other processes and then it's gonna go over to the side and get in line to have a scope mounted on it and go to the range and have it test fired before it ships out to the customer. Hopefully, I would have this view even if I wasn't in a firearms related business. But when you look at the intent of the Second Amendment, uh, who wrote it, why it was written, when it was written, you look at all the Federalist Papers, which is a lot of the originating you know, ideas were hammered out in those and exactly how they were gonna word it and how they were gonna put it. And then also look at, what do we call it again? We call it the Second Amendment. It only comes in behind freedom of speech. They were very, very careful in how they worded it. They just got through fighting for the liberty of this whole country, trying to get away from tyranny, get away from iron-fisted rule, all this type of thing. Just basically leave us alone and let us govern ourselves. At the time the Second Amendment was written, everything that they were trying to protect with the Second Amendment was state-of-the-art. And when they first invented gunpowder, they thought, oh, it's the end of the world. We're gonna kill everybody in the end of the world. You know, that didn't happen. And they first invented machine guns. Oh, it's the end of the world. Everybody's gonna die. Didn't happen. Nuclear weapons, end of the world, everybody's gonna die. So far, knock on wood, hadn't happened. You know, everybody uses that as a scare tactic on that kind of stuff. And when you put it in context of when it was written, when it was actually originated, and the reason that they put it in there wasn't for deer hunting, it wasn't for going and shooting pheasant, any of that kind of stuff, it wasn't for recreational shooting, it was to protect ourselves from an overreaching government. And for the people that are some of the biggest enemies of the Second Amendment, they're very carefully using the First Amendment to work around and misinform and, and do some things to try to destroy 
the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, and several other amendments that are below there that guarantee our personal rights. It's not something the government is given out. It's not theirs to give. It's something that you're born with. You know, everything that we consider to be freedoms and liberties right now, which is quickly going away, future generations coming up are not realizing what's being stripped away, is standing firmly on the shoulders of the First and Second Amendment. We're all on the same team. Okay, we're all on the same team. Uh, there's been no backing off. I'm not doing it to impress anybody. I'm doing it because it's a passion. <laughs> yeah, say that. <laughs> uh, you was wondering, how much longer am I going to do this? Kind of joking, but dead serious. You know, I feel my pulse. As long as I can feel it bump in there, I'm going to keep doing this. 